let's introduce our panel real quick. We have Jeff Miller from Durham, North Carolina. He's our technical manager, keeps everything straight for us. Uh, Jim Kokonis is our presenter today, co-presenter, I should say. Jim is coming to us from uh, the planet Zebulon, Zebulon, North Carolina. Jim's one of our senior curriculum developers. And we have Rich Falco. Rich needs no introduction, but I'll introduce him anyway, just to be nice. Uh, Rich is one of our... Rich is one of our very talented CTI instructors, and he's coming to us from Florida today. So we're all over the board. So with that, I'm going to let Jim kick it off, and we'll get this going. So if you're not familiar, if you weren't here for some of the others, we're going to use um, some Electude simulators as a way to have a conversation and talk about how we are going to diagnose basic electrical systems. We are also going to have available to us for conversation um, the PHET simulations. This is the physics education training department from the University of Colorado in Boulder. And they make these simulations available for download where you can go to the website and you can download a whole bunch of different simulators that cover a concept in physics. So yes, even if we didn't particularly care for math and science and physics and so forth in school, now that we're working on cars and dealing with electricity and fluid flow and hydraulics, it's all physics. So they make these available for use. You can donate to the program. And if uh, someone like myself uses them in the education process, uh, we just have to give credit for where this information came from so everybody knows who to support on it. It's not something that we built. I also have a camera set up on a, on a simulator board here that we have a, a voltmeter and a camera that we can run some live tests on some circuits that I have here on the desk in front of me. So with that being said, Rich, what were the let's see laws right you love the laws and the math is that what i remember everybody knows that the laws are my favorite thing or is that <laughs> do you have those do you have those little triangle pointed things that indicate sarcasm in that yes, text yes okay I should, I should so <laughs> <laughs> so when, when rich teaches electricity he he goes i don't care about the math so much and then you know I just want you to understand how it works. Um, I'm one that says, if you understand the laws, you're going to ask better questions and probably not get lost. I am from the South. So you're probably not going to get lost in the rhubarb patch as easily because you'll ask yourself a little bit better questions. So the way I want to start this off is what process are we going to use in our diagnostic approach? And what are we going to try and cover today? We're here for an hour and a half of the presentation and we'll stick around another half hour for, for Q and A. Um, but what we're going to go after is continue the conversation about the characteristics of voltage, current and resistance in a working circuit, we're pretty much going to stick to standard series or parallel circuits that we would deal with on a car. We're going to use the simulators to take those problems to the vehicle and, and work with how we could approach real world vehicles. And then the other thing that we're going to do is we got to apply logic to this. If we're dealing with a system of electricity and circuits and so forth, the only reason it works is because it's logical and it's consistent. And so we want our test procedure to be logical and assistant and, and assistant consistent. Here's a question for you. And this is, there's no right or wrong answer to this. How many of you have a fixed diagnostic approach for a specific type of failure. Like, okay, this is an electrical problem. Here's my sheet for going over electrical problems. So how many of you try to 
think about the system and the complaint and find the best place to get started. So if I, if I show you guys this process, I, a long time ago, I started um, reading about this guy named Edwards Deming and the continual improvement process. And that translated into the Toyota way because this guy was back in the forties and a general took him over to a Pacific Island and uh, used his tools and techniques to help rebuild their industry after World War II. This, this continual improvement process, if we look at it, uh, when I started studying it, he, he kind of got laughed out of the US because everybody was very short term in maximizing profit and fixing problems after the, you know, let's get the product out, let's make the money. And then if something breaks, we'll fix that later. And he was, he was trying to say that if we worked hard on getting it right the first time and working on our process, we could be accurate, we could be efficient, and we could be profitable without having to add a whole bunch of extra cost even to the customer or to the product that we're making. And so the whole thing is, how do we choose a direction? How do we, how do we set a path? And he came up with this thing called the continual improvement cycle. It wasn't me, it wasn't Rich, it wasn't Randy, it wasn't anybody else. This has been around since the 40s. Um, and it was, it was steps of plan, do, check, or study, and act. And it is a way of keeping us on target with our diagnosis. So the first thing we need to do is come up with a plan. And I can tell from some of your answers, whether you consciously do this or not, some of you are already doing it. You're asking yourself questions. This car is in my bay for X reason. Uh, it won't start. Well, that's the ticket we get, right? Here, here's the vehicle, no start, fix it. And we have questions because we're technicians and we're like, why won't it start? Is this a crank no start? Was this thing driving down the road and made a really bad, out loud, ugly noise and now it won't restart? Well, that's gonna change my mind on where I might start, right, Rich? Absolutely. Um, vehicle had a fire in the front end, now it won't start. Well, that's gonna change my approach too. Um, we, we need good information to get started on a plan and we need an understanding of how it works. Would you agree with that, Rich? Can you just, I yes. saw you taking a drink, so I figured I'd ask you a question. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so would you say that if I find my, if I find myself going, huh, in trying to make a plan or ask a good question, what, what would you do, Rich? What would you tell me to do? Uh, do some more research. Um, look at service information, look at a wiring diagram, uh, even phone a friend. Uh, but we need more information before we can develop that, that plan. So if I don't have a good question, I need more information to put into my planning. Yes. So, yes. so here's, here's a quick representation of how that would work. Here's one cycle. This is not a one and done cycle. So if I have a plan and I can't make myself come up with a good question, the first thing I'm going to do is go find out more about what I'm working on. So if it's a piece of equipment that's new to me, if it's a, uh, if it's a vehicle system that's new to me, I'm going to go read service information. I'm going to look at description and operation. I may pull a wiring diagram, but I'm going to go do research. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm not just going to go like, okay, I looked up, I looked up something. I'm going to ask myself, well, what does that mean to me? what did I get out of that? I'm going to study the results or the information that I got out of this thing that I just did, which was read or look at pictures or a wiring diagram. And then I'm going to act on that. And in this case, the, I'm going to plug that back into my knowledge base and go, okay, can I make a better plan or ask a better question? And then I'm going to do one thing, study the results of that and act on it. And this is a repetitive cycle. And it doesn't need to be six steps, eight steps, 12 steps. It is very short. These things could be as simple as a 30 second cycle or a 10 minute cycle, depending on what the do is, okay?
But if we constantly do that, we're going to get to a point where I know what the fault is. And my next plan is to write up the estimate and tell the customer what it's going to take to fix it. And then I'm going to fix it and I'm going to check everything. And if all my results come back good, I'm done. I don't need to make a new plan. I can, my next plan is to <laughs> write the bill for the customer and, and move on. And it doesn't have to be a big, long drawn out thing. Like, like Jim said, you get handed a repair order that says uh, car won't start. You, you know, your, your first thought is, well, is it just a dead battery? Well, then my plan is let me reach in and turn the key. That's that, or my plan is let me see if it's a dead battery. Do is turn the key, but turn the key and nothing happens. Oh, okay. You know, we have a, we have a way to go. And it's, and it's just circling back to that over and over and over again. I have four vehicles queued up with problems and we're going to actually go through these and we're going to have a conversation about how we would approach it and why. Uh, if you're not familiar with the simulators, I can zoom in and get pretty good views of different things here on the vehicle. There's as close as I can get in on the fuse box. Um, obviously we have a four cylinder engine here, battery, and then off to the side, I have the equivalent of an instrument panel. So I can start this vehicle up and run it. I have a work order here. Now, some things I can't zoom in on very easily. So if you can't read it, just ask the question in chat. Rich will help me watch it. Um, I have a work order here. This one says engine overheats. Um, repair is needed. And we're not going to worry about filling in everything that we do on our work order, but we have the ability to turn on a, um, a multimeter. At least we should have. Um, we have a scan tool that we can use. We have a breakout box that we can use fuel pressure gauge. We have a jump starter. Um, we have a wiring diagram. So we don't really have service information on this vehicle. Don't even ask me what kind of vehicle it is because it's a toy Chrysler Honda Ford BMW, whatever. Um, it's, a, is that accurate, Rich? Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a composite car, but as I hover over things, if you're wondering, so here's the engine control unit in the center. Um, that's injector number three, injector number four, they're labeled across there. Um, there's the engine cooling fan and there's a fuel pump. So I'm gonna put this wiring diagram back. We also have an invoice, but we're not gonna worry with that. So the work order says engine overheats repair as needed. So here we go. Time to get fired up in chat. Time to turn your mic on if you want. Here's the question. There's really no wrong answers here, but where would you start with this vehicle? It's, in, it's you've just been handed this ticket. It says engine overheats repair is needed. For the purpose of our class, obviously I'm picking electrical issues but I am perfectly okay with people talking about checking coolant level or what they would do in the class or in the shop. And the reason for that is what are people actually doing is if we go back to this whole plan, do study and act, people are asking questions to put into their plan. If I have an engine that's low on coolant, I better correct that first. And, you know, Hans was like, check the oil. I'd hate to be fixing an overheating problem with an engine that's got one quarter oil in the sump and have, you know, oh, I found the problem with the coolant, but it's never going to get hot again because I just locked it up. So real world in the shop, we're going to do some, some things that are best practices. But yes, um, it's got coolant, it's got oil, uh, I'm, I'm trying to be the customer here. We have not been having to add any coolant to it at service intervals. There's no even recent repair history of a coolant system repair. 
somebody says, are the fans coming on? Test the fan motor. Check for power and ground at the cooling fans with it commanded on. So there we go. Now we have approaches. So there's my question. Let's stop right there. Check for power and ground at the cooling fans with it commanded on. Let's wait for a response there. Or power probe. Okay. okay. I don't have a power probe in my toolbox here. We should, we should have that conversation. So I don't have a power probe, but I could go down here. Everything on this car is easy to get to. Absolutely. So Absolutely. when we talked about doing a voltage drop, one of the things we talked about was with our simulators, if, if we turn a circuit on and we have a voltmeter and we can go across our load and then we can go or go across our battery and we have 13 and a half volts. If I go across the load and I see something really close to source, it kind of tells me that the circuit is in good condition. Okay. I'm seeing Use your scan tool and command the fan on. Both Steven and An Kevin bring up some good points. Another check codes uh, for info and also to see if over temperature codes are present indicating possible engine damage. All right. All us techs want to see why a, you know what, but this, but this is part of the class. Absolutely. This check is exactly, this is about the logic. And so, Let's go ahead and turn the key on and let's identify this vehicle and let's check for codes. In memory, we have a fan control circuit and a fan rationality check code. So P P0480 and a P0483. So we do have some codes. And if I go to control units and I go to the ECM, um, I can start this vehicle up because we hate running batteries down, right? And I can go to actuator tests. Uh-oh. Seemed to put it in some kind of a preset mode, didn't it? And I can't control the fan. Let me pull codes again. Did you see the check engine light came on? The check engine light came on. Idle control system higher than expected. That was generated by putting it in test mode. We're gonna ignore that one. Let's, let's do a key on engine off run of that actuator test. I don't hear any clicking. So somebody was saying we could check at the fan. So I'm going to look at my battery voltage and go, okay, my battery voltage right now is 12 volts. I'm going to go across the load at the fan and I'm going to turn command the relay on what do you guys what do you guys think so far based on what we know about the system and what we just tested what does it look like is going on incomplete circuit okay so Lee, you want a wiring diagram? I give you a wiring diagram. Let me turn this key off. Hans can't hear the relay, so it could be ECM control or bad relay. William, I would jump the relay to split the circuit just because I don't always trust my scan tool special functions. <laughs> that's a very good point, yes. You know what that's, you know what the difference between knowledge and wisdom is, right? <laughs> Wisdom is what you get when you're finding knowledge that you needed. Um, 
if we're looking at our wiring diagram here, this is the fan that we're hoping to get to come on. And this K1 is the fan relay. Fuse 15 is the supply for the fan. And we have power coming off the relay to the fan and then going to ground. And what's this green wire? ECM, ECM feedback. feedback. Did, and, and we had a code too, correct? Input to PCM, yes. Yes, we did. We did or have fan a Fan rationality, I think it was. It was fan rationality and fan control circuit. Okay. So if we think about that, if we think about that, I'm going to put, I'm going to put the diagnostic tester away for a minute here. I'm going to put, Let's recheck my battery to make sure I'm not killing it here. Got 12 volts. This is the fuse for the fan, correct? Mm -hmm. And it's easy to access, so it's an easy quick test. Does this test have any validity for me right now? Voltage drop across the fuse. Han says the load, the load isn't, there. isn't there. I turn the key on and I get my tester back out. This is telling me there's no current flowing, isn't it, Hans? No voltage drop. Voltage drop. Zero drop. Even if I put it on millivolts, which is where I really would normally do this test, I got nothing. So nothing's happening with this relay. Do we have power to that fuse? Do we know that yet? Well, there's a good question. It looked like it was hot at all times. And it appears to be hot at all times. On both sides, all right. Well, it's hot on both sides. We know it could have a problem underneath in the fuse box. But the question is, where does the power go from the fuse? And we can pull our wiring diagram back out and look at that. So from the fuse, it goes in this red and white wire and comes out an orange wire. Do you agree with that? Am I looking at it yes. right, Rich? So the red and white wire is back here. I've got power there. All right. Mm -hmm. I'm obviously not getting power out here because when we try and activate it, we command it on and it should be putting power out to the fans on this wire, but it's not. So the next thing we would have to look at is what? <sighs> Hans would get his amp clamp out. Hans, we have no amp clamp. Come up with another test. I have no amp clamp here. I haven't bought one yet. Everybody said that a good one was $400. Um, <laughs> and I don't want to spend $400 right now. Hans says, since you, we couldn't you, hear the relay, I'd check that next. <laughs> your ninety four Chevy. your ninety four Chevy. Nice. Oh goodness. So bypass the relay. Check relay. Bypass to see if the fan runs. So it looks like the relay gets power on pin one, and then is controlled off of pin four at pin two at the ECU. All right. So what do you think about checking the control side of the relay to see if it's okay? Is everybody good there? 
check relay, bypass it, and see if the fan runs. All right, well, we're not going to bypass anything quite yet. But, oops, put away the wiring diagram. What are you laughing at, Rich? What did I miss? Somebody's a, somebody's a step ahead of us. Go ahead. Keep going where you're going. Okay. So there's the power coming to the relay. And then this is the wire that goes to the ECM. Okay. So before we go any farther, have you guys seen us following this path? We come up with a plan, we do a test, we go, what does that mean? And we act on it. Next plan comes up with the next test. We look at what that means and we act on it. So we tested to see if we had power to the fuse and we did. We tested to see if we had power coming from the fuse to the load side of the relay and we did. We had earlier tested to see if we had power coming out of the load side of the relay down to the fan, and we didn't. And that's what brought us back up here. Okay. Yes, Randy, the key is off. Does it matter? Does it matter with our wiring diagram right now that the key is off? We don't see the source. Well, okay, well, so, okay, so what does that mean? There's two reasons we wouldn't see the source here. Well, there's three. I can go through a bunch of reasons, but based on the testing we've done. Go back to that other wire, Jim, if you can. Go back to there is power into the control side of the relay. So we've that... Got that is power here at pin one. I go to pin four and I see zero volts. I don't see like 0 0.00216. I see zero volts when I go to the other side. What is this telling me? What do you guys think? William says it's an open relay. William, why is it an open relay? Do you, Han says the coil is open, open windings in the relay. Now relay says, re Larry says relay stuck open. Do we want to go back to the PHET to? I don't actually have a full blown relay here. Here's, here's what we're looking at. If this, is the coil inside that relay that would close the contacts. If this load right here is that load in the relay, we checked our source. We went to the power supply to the control side of the coil and then Right now, the key is off, so the computer can't be doing anything to command it on, so it's an open circuit. It should be an open circuit. We came to the outlet side of that control relay, the control side of that circuit, and we measured zero volts. If that relay coil internally was in good condition, we would see voltage all the way down to that computer. And when the computer was powered on and we commanded it on, that's when we would see the voltage drop <clears throat> to almost nothing. I'm putting a little bit of resistance in the wires to make this realistic. We would normally see a little bit of something. We would normally see a little bit of something. When that circuit goes open, we see source because there is nothing to cause that voltage drop. Earth controlled from the ECM, yes. Hans, um, one of the things that happens in electrical 
what you what you stated there the coil windings are continuous should flow voltage um from a mental model standpoint think about whether we flow voltage or do we flow current if the if the circuit is continuous we should have voltage at all points in the circuit on a series circuit um when current is flowing we'll see some drop in voltage so what you're sta stating is 100% accurate. I like the way you're thinking. Um, the voltage should pass through this device and it's looking for a way to complete the circuit and try and do some work. And so what we don't have is, what we actually have would be this device is open. And so that's what we have. I'm trying to measure, but it's not getting through to here. So if that's the case, we had a plan, we checked, we had a plan, we checked, we had a plan, we checked, we checked here, verified that we had no output. We verified that we had power here. That says, okay, let me go to the next point. We came here. We don't see the power. We've studied that a little bit together. There's your wiring diagram. What's the next thing you would do on this car as you follow your logical thought process? Where would you go next? Jumper the ground? To a switch for the customer. All right, we can't be friends anymore, William. <laughs> <laughs> okay, truth be told, how many of us have opened up, um, opened up a vehicle and looked on the dash and saw like a light switch from a house on the dash? Oh my goodness. Larry says replace relay. Larry says replace relay. I like that. Okay. Um, one of the things we could theoretically do is we could pull that relay out. Um, I'm going to stick this over here just so I can see. We could physically test this relay because why not? And we could check that coil to see if it's actually open. And we are out of luck. Some meters will give you OL or whatever. But we are seeing no continuity across this. So I'm going to do the fastest repair, call the parts department, replace this part. It gave me a new one and we put it in and now we can verify with the same test we found the problem, right? Sure set the voltage. I'm getting there. So now we've got 12 volts here. And now we have that coming through. So what's the best way to verify that our repair was accurate? Drive it. Drive it. We, and we will drive it. We will drive it. We're going to talk about it. Let's get through here. Let's turn the key on. I'm going to go to actuator tests. Ah. So two things, we hear the fan run, and now when that gets connected to ground, is that too loud? A little bit, that's good. That's better. Now we see the control side of that relay drop to nearly ground when the computer commands that circuit on, and the fan runs. And then on top of that, we could go to live data we can look at engine coolant temperature. And we can look at fan voltage. And we can display just those two PIDs right now. We'll start the car. Take the multimeter out of here. And then we're going to try and blow this thing up a little bit here.
go ahead and get it warmed up. No, I wouldn't push a customer's car like crazy. But in the interest of time, here we're watching data. And we're watching engine coolant temp. We're watching engine coolant temp climb. And the green trace at the bottom there is actually this wire coming into the computer for when the relay kicks on. So as the temperature climbs and the computer commands the fan relay on, it's actually looking for voltage on this wire. The oil's thinning out. It's picking up RPM. <laughs> So we're coming up to almost 100 degrees Celsius, and there it is. And now the computer is seeing the engine cool down. And when it goes below the threshold, it'll shut the fan off and then heat back up. And let's take this out. Would you guys call that a confirmed fix? I would. I would. I'd say we're done. Good job. <laughs> so, any questions about that one and that process? We're good? I think we're all right. So, let's shut that car off. So now we have another vehicle. <clears throat> this one says, customer says the engine has a slight hesitation and the mill is on. Diagnose and repair is needed. Anybody want to play with this one? Who's got a mic? Who's got a mic? Raise your hand. Everybody, nobody likes to raise their hand and go live here. Why is that? Everybody might be at work on a Friday. Well, that and that is true. It's probably that you guys will have to come back on a on an evening when you've got your mic in, and you don't have to try and do this in a noisy shop environment. Sitting at home with a drink in your hand. Best kind of class. <laughs> it's just got to be water. All right. So here we are. We have a vehicle. We have a complaint. Customer says the engine has a slight hesitation. The mill is on. Diagnosis and repair is needed. I think most of us will say we're all going to start in the same spot. Where where would be the first thing, the first thing you would do on this car? What's your plan? Give me your first do trying to diagnose this car. Lunch break is over. Uh, they're still here. Scanner. Scanner. Drive it. Drive it. Check, codes. Check codes. Check codes. Hook up scan Check tool. Check codes. Hook up a scan tool. Pull codes. Whenever I get a ticket that says a mill is on, the first thing I want to know is why. So let's try that. Let's uh, get one of those. Let's do one of those. Let's ID the vehicle. And pull codes. All right, depending on what you're on, if you can't read that, we've got a cylinder three misfire detected. That's in memory. We've got an ignition coil C primary secondary circuit malfunction. And something to do with idle control system RPM lower than expected. Some cars will set that if they have a idle misfire. Okay, so we, we've hooked up a scan tool. We've pulled a code. What do you want to do now? Steven says visual inspection, which is always a good idea. Okay. Somebody's already diagnosed it as high resistance in coil. What kind of coil do we have here? Swap the coils. Tron swap tronics. Swap tronics. All right. Do me a favor. If, if Swaptronics causes you heartburn, raise your hand. If you hate the idea of Swaptronics. If you hate the idea, and leave them up for a minute. 
a couple people. Paul, you suggested it and you raised your hand. <laughs> what am I going to do with you? <laughs> He's one okay. of my guys. Just blame it on me. No, 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 no. It's not, well, all right, Rich, it's all your fault. All right. <laughs> I'm not a, I'm not a fan. Okay. I'm not a fan either. Fuck Paul God. says it's flat rate, flat life. rate life. says it works where it works causes issues to float around like cancer sometimes you know every one of those answers i respect and i completely understand where it's coming from um i did a whole bunch of research for a toyota class not too long ago and toyota actually teaches um swapping parts where it's appropriate and they will tell you they're trying to get the guys to diagnose with the you know, with the least parts possible on a, on an engine like this, where everything's like right here, staring you in the face. Um, and it's pretty easy. Could you pretty easily swap a couple of these coils? Absolutely. Um, and I'll even demo that. But if we go back to these codes, where would you, if you had to actually test, where would you start your testing? Would you trust this thing? Would you verify it? Would you start the car up? See if it sounds like it's missing right now. What would you do? If it was me, I'd start it up and see if I can replicate this one. I've had some scan tools misidentify the cylinder misfires. That can happen. Start it. Look, it even shakes, Hans. It looks like a misfire. Road test. Well, we can't really do a road test on this. Sounds like a misfire. I agree. Sounds like a misfire. So. For a four cylinder, that's probably one of the least uh, boggy three cylinder one misfire and I've seen. So. We know we've got a misfire. Now, how would you approach it? Let's not go right with the Swaptronics, guys. Let's go with some diagnosis and testing. This is look at live data. Oh, he's saying if it has a misfire counter. I don't remember. I've never worked on one I've of these seen... before, Hans. <laughs> Let's see. Based on that coolant reservoir, this is a Volkswagen. This, this has no idea what it is. <laughs> the VCU's in the wrong spot. Trevor says know. relative compression test. Skip to fuel trim. Han says skip to fuel trim. So I'm going to put the, the fuel trims up and display them. Thing doesn't even look like it's in fuel control. It's zeroed out. Open loop because of the codes? Could be. That's why I was trying to warm it up, see if I get to go closed. How about we just unplug a coil? There we go. Oh. All right, I'm going to stop right here and tell you that on some cars, I can make a diagnosis off of that right there. What am I thinking, Rich? Thinking. Oh, spark ignition related. Why? That's what I would be thinking. <laughs> you would have to know Hans a little bit of... Yeah, Hans is saying in, in, Ignition injector. or coil. Yep. Ignition or coil. So you would have to know a little bit about uh, the type of fuel control system it has on it and how it works. Um, 
you'd have to know year, make, and model to know if the um, manifold design and upstream sensor placement was getting a good sample of all four cylinders at its mix point. <clears throat> um, but when it's typically when it's ignition, um, this one's not, this one's not displaying the, by the way it was displaying, if it was behaving like some I've seen in the past or a lot that I've seen in the past of the older, what was that year Chevy Hans you were talking about? Some of the older vehicles on a four cylinder, one dead injector would cause about a 25% trim shift because if one of them wasn't hit, hitting, it would try and add fuel to get it to balance out. If it was ignition on the other hand though, the presence of fuel vapors would cause it to, um, would cause it to read differently on the O2 sensor because an O2 sensor is a catalyst and fuel vapors would behave different, but then you'd have to be looking at, okay, is the injector being cut off when it detects the misfire? And we don't know any of that about this car. So what would be your next approach? Pull the coil and see if it's firing. I don't have the ability to put a tester in here. We can unplug but before, it. But before we, uh, Rich, before oh, we touch anything, no, 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 that's <laughs> fine. You can, you can, you can go either, you can go either way you want. Um, if we want to verify if it's this coil, would you unplug this coil right now with it running and see if it changes? That was a question to you, Rich. Me? We shouldn't be. Why? Uh, <coughs> there's uh, a good chance we could spike the PCM or cause a problem, so we'd want to do a Ooh. key off. Ford okay. actually has a TSV for that, so... Uh, I know it's common practice for us to unplug coils with the car running, but just be careful. Sounds the same, doesn't it? I think the identification <laughs> of cylinder three is accurate. That's worse. Now we got a two cylinder. So it's this cylinder. Cylinder number three. Now we've gone and disturbed things. Could that have caused a problem? Absolutely. Okay. As, as William says. Could it cause a problem if we put a scope probe in this thing? Back probing or wire piercing, you know. Absolutely. All I'm saying, all I'm saying is, all I'm saying is be aware of it, but let's go get, let's go get a scope. We don't have inductive probes, Hans, but good point. We're rocking it old school. <laughs> okay. We're rocking it old school. Swap the coil. Swap the coil. We're going to get there. <laughs> we'll, we'll do that for kicks and giggles. But if we look at the coils, before we do any other test, somebody tell me, what type of coils are these actually? Take that hour. <laughs> what kind of coils are these? What do you see in the wiring diagram? If you had no description in operation, you had no training, but you had this wiring diagram, what do you see? The switching's done in the coils. coils. Bingo. Bingo. Module in ignition, control ignition by PCM. controlled by PCM. Same, same thing. Yep. Yep. Different words, different words. So we know that because we see this transistor in here and we're obviously the ECU is pulsing that transistor to turn on current flow through the coil. And so every one of these has a ground that goes to the PCM 
in a lot of these cars that ground will be shared typically but the control is some type of a digital on and off to set the dwell and timing on each individual cylinder everybody good with that so what's our test Scope all right. the things. Scope all the things. Nice. Let's say we take a look at this middle signal. The PCM commands coil, Stephen says. I like it. Does that look like a coil command? It looks like a five volt toggle to run that ignition coil. Looks good to me. Is that a good pattern? Oh, good point. Good point. Well, I, I like what Hans said. What is that? We don't know. Compare it to another coil. Exactly. I'm all, I'm all about that instead of swapping them. Looks like the exact same pattern, doesn't it? Yep, seems okay. Now let's look at the what should be the ground wire. Should be a good ground, right? Let's look at the ground wire on the one that's got a problem. Uh oh. Check power and ground. Well, I'll tell you what, without changing the, the um, scope setup on this, or if you want, I can bring in a multimeter and I can show you. Oops. Show you that the power wire is good. I should not have that on a ground wire. Would you agree with that? No bueno. We didn't see it on the other one. The known good. The ones that are not setting codes do not have that. So based on what we know and what equipment we have, What's wrong with this car? Somebody throw an answer out. Open ground. Okay. So William, how will we test for an open ground? Would you go between the, the coil and the ECU? If you go between the coil and the ECU, Normally what we would do is disconnect power, right? We would disconnect power. I'm putting away probes here. And we would actually check for continuity between that wire right here and the ECU. Because of what's what we have available to us and how things work here, we actually are going to have to use a breakout box. Probably so, not my preferred way of doing it. Well, Paul brings up a good point. Check at the ECU and see if you have the same pattern. Okay. So. Let's do that. I'm going to minimize this so I don't have to pull everything off again. So that's going to be the blue wire at pin 22. I like the thought process there.
That looks like a no. Whatever is happening here isn't getting to there. What does that tell us? Uh, you're a piercer. Sorry, I don't have any piercers. We don't judge here, William. I, 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 I pierce wires uh, regularly if needed. So you would say it's a broken wire? William says broken wire. Break in the wire. Now Hans says short between the ground and the signal. Or open ground. Okay. Yeah, open an open ground I would go with. We if it was short. short if it was shorted to ground, I bet you it would be working normally. We'd have a code in the computer probably, but we I think we wouldn't have a misfire. Yeah. That would be my guess. On this so part. let me uh let me shut it off. I'll show you how easy it is to do wiring repair in this system. Okay. So we're saying that this wire is potentially open. Let's see how many people are still awake or back to lunch or whatever, back from lunch or you know, they're on a test drive. If you're on a test drive, don't participate in this question. Okay. Based on what you've seen, how many people would be comfortable with replacing this wire here? This number three wire saying that it's open. All right, so we're gonna do it. I'm gonna click on it and I'm gonna say replace this wire. And you see it disappeared and it came back. So now, what do we do? We replicate the test we did. <laughs> Honestly, now without load testing it to another ground, you could have put a ground on it. The overlaid fact the the, you could have overlaid a ground. The fact that you had a pattern here and you did not have a pattern at the ECU says there is a break between here and the ECU. So going to unhook the breakout box. I'm going to put the breakout box away. I'm going to hook the computer back up and we're going to repeat the test that we just did. Make a connection. It's really sensitive. So there's our control trigger. Oh, it already sounds smoother, Rich. And the, anom the anomaly on the ground side is gone. We have a good ground. How much is that <laughs> wire replacement tool? Um, I don't we know. We all what's want the, one. What's a, what's a subscription to Electric? <laughs> Randy, is there is there a job opportunity for a virtual mechanic? <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. That would that would be absolutely awesome to be able to do it like this. Like virtual cars, yes. On virtual cars, yes, I'm sure exactly. We're just a, I'm sure we're just a step away. <laughs> the, uh, well, is, isn't that what it's going to be like as these cars continue to become cloud connected and everything else? Keep driving. I'm gathering data. So if we were actually working on this car, we'd go back in. We would delete our fault codes. And we would start it. We would take it on a test drive. Uh-oh. Do we still have a mill? Do we get the battery low? Because that'd be a result of us yeah, doing yeah, all I testing think, with the battery I on. I think that's exactly what we did. seems to be happy now we're not setting any we're not setting any ignition coil codes all right okay are we good guys i'm good thanks good. everybody for spending your friday afternoon with us okay you guys be safe out there thank you